Dute, um, please introduce the book for me and tell me a little bit about how it started. Okay, so the book is titled The Yoruba Sound Book for Children, and um, it is a bilingual, comprehensive, educational, fun, interactive book that is that I author to really help children um, learn the Yoruba language. So the key word is bilingual because it's not just Yoruba, it's Yoruba and English. So everything you find in Yoruba is translated to English and vice versa. And the book is a first of its kind in the sense that in our community, I don't believe there is an interactive book like this that is as comprehensive, right? And it all started from my my passion really to um, pass on this culture and this language to my own children because I have little children. And I think it's very important to instill in them a sense of identity, right? And part of doing that is to ensure that they understand their language, right? And they appreciate their cultural heritage. And so in so doing, my hope is that I can also encourage and motivate other parents or adults like myself to do the same thing. Um, and I think the more of us um, that get engaged in this process, the better it would be for, for the community and help maybe even in, you know, educate other people who may not know about Africa or African cultures, right? So it's starting with a, a sort of a specific focus, but I think there are advantages to this project that can go beyond my own family and even my own community. I just wanted to say, I was doing some research on the book and I read all the interviews you sent me and I love them. And I really connect with how right. you want the children to be, like learn their language and be bilingual and have it stick with them um, for the rest of their lives. Because my parents also did that for me. They're from originally from Bosnia. So they taught me Bosnian first. And a lot of people are shocked when they hear me speak when we go visit the country. They're like, awesome. oh, you speak so well. So I think this book will be really, really, really helpful. Um, Thank you. And I also heard in an interview that you were trying to teach your kids Yoruba. Um, how old were they when you started to teach them? So this process actually started uh, in 2020, as soon as the pandemic hit. I had always had the idea to to do this, right? But it 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 became even more of an urge for me during the pandemic because I recognized that if there was such a time that, you know, the, you know, unfortunately, you know, it was, it was a pandemic that caused everyone to be still, right? But in that time frame, I recognized that the hustle and bustle was going to be reduced. And if there was ever a time that I could really harness, you know, my resources and get this done, it was it was during that time. So it started 2020 and at the time my kids were, my oldest was um, three and a half, I believe. Yeah, or just about, yeah, three and a half going on four, I believe. And then my younger one was about 15 months, <laughs> you know? And so they were really very little, but the thing about teaching a second of, of a language is that you have to do it really early. Right, you have to do it at a point where they're still receptive to 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 wanting to learn, because the older they get, the more you have to negotiate <laughs> and sort of convince them as to why it's important. Right now, they don't. In fact, my six year old right now, he's asking me to say, "Well, when I'm in school, nobody speaks Yoruba, so why do I need to learn?" And I t and I tell him because it's part of your cultural heritage, right? Mm -hmm. And I got so excited that as soon as he asked that question, a few, you know, a week or two later, I had the opportunity to host the children's hour with Yoruba language where there were other children interested in learning the language. And so I could point to him and say, see, you're not the only one <laughs> that wants to learn Yoruba there. Like 15 other, you know, children that really want to learn it and look at how everybody's having fun. So um, to, to answer your question, it started 2020 and uh, it was because my kids were little enough, uh, you know, really little and I wanted to start that process early. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, I So in an interview that you also shared, you mentioned that drums are very important to the Yoruba uh, culture. So can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit more about the culture and describe some of the other common traditions there? 
Right. So the Yoruba culture is really rich. Um, it's such a rich culture. And I, I, I'm, I marvel at the fact that some of my counterparts are not understanding how important and rich and deep the culture is. And of course, that's that's a whole nother topic in and of itself. So I, I would just stay focused on the question, right? Responding to the question. The Yoruba culture, um, we, Yoruba people are very respectful, right? Um, we really, <laughs> from when you're little, you're taught to, um, be humble, you're taught to respect your elders, so much so that we have the physical demonstration of that respect. So when you see elders, the males with the ballet, which is portrayed to show that they are respectful of the, the elders, and the females will kumle, which is to, you know, uh, curtsy to the ground, right? We've since modernized it because, you know, the floor is a little bit dirty oftentimes, so it's not every single time you see an elder, you have to go all the way down. But the idea is that you show some, some respect, you know? And I think in so doing, right, children then don't get defiant when they're older because you've, they, they've been bred with this idea of respect and humility such that when they get older and you as their parent or their grandparent, you're teaching them what to do, they don't come back and tell you, you're not, you don't have the right to tell me because no, 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 because they've learned from when they were younger that this is just how we do. So culture is important in that way is that it's sort of like a, a vehicle to teach your children values, right? And, and give them expectations like, this is what we do and this is what we do not do. So that's one aspect of it. It's a big part of it. The drums that you talked about, that your black people are very, we like to celebrate, right? <laughs> we're we're family-oriented people, uh, I believe, right? And so we like to celebrate and uh, there's it's never a small celebration. You always have the cousins and the cousins will invite other extended families. So if you think that you're gonna have a party of just 15 people, think again, because a hundred people will probably show up, <laughs> right? And so the drumming is sort of like a staple in the Yoruba culture. We like, you know, it, and, and, and it traces, it goes back even, you know, hundreds of years, because that's really in the um, ancient days, if you will, drums were a way to communicate to, from one village to another. So they were able to communicate, you know, if there was danger, you know, the, the drummer in one village would beat the drum and then the sound would carry to another village and they and then they carry it on. So it was sort of like a way to communicate to, you know, so it's a, uh, and there are different kinds of drums, you know, there, I, 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 and I believe there are certain kinds that are used for specific purposes, but in general, it's just a way to celebrate and it had its own, uh, there were communicative tools in the past. Great. Yeah, I did see that. I, I was looking at a website to see what the drums were called, and there were so many different kinds. So many. Gong Gong and Iyayu and, you know, there's so... Apparently, uh, the, the way that the Yoruba people, they always sold uh, drums in a set of threes to represent the family. Uh, I, I just learned that recently that they always had the father drum, the mother drum and the child drum. And that even speaks to what I was saying about the Yoruba people, which is that we're family oriented, you know, people in general. Now, all of the things I'm saying are in general, right? You know, yes. you, I, I don't want to be too prescriptive here or make it seem like every every time you meet a Yoruba person, they would all, you know, yeah. I, this Can is you just, talk about yeah. the, talking, the talking drum? Yeah, that's so that's what I was saying in terms of, okay, the talking drum is essentially a drum that is that the skilled drummer would beat and it sort of it mimics how you would talk. Right. So and I and scientifically, I think there is some relevance to this and don't. But I think our ancestors figured out that there were they were. Um, syllables, a certain number of syllables that you could speak that the human brain could accommodate at any given time to learn. So the drum were always in uh, beats of seven. So if you wanted to, in general, so if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to communicate something and you wanted the children to learn or you wanted the people to learn, you would they will beat it and an interpreter would oftentimes know what the what the message you know that was being communicated was, 
right? Because it's mimicking how you speak and it's done in such a way that uh, it's in a set of sevens. And so it's easy to accommodate, it's easy to understand. And the drum itself is sort of like uh, the tone, uh, the way that it's beaten, it, it mimics uh, uh, verbal communication. So the interpreter oftentimes knows what's being communicated. And then it's in a form of a song, right? So I, I wish I could um, get an example. That, that would be amazing, honestly. Wow, I would love to yeah. see that. That's amazing. Because, um, and, and let me say this, the reason why all of these are all tied, you know, is that in the Yoruba culture, we passed on our history through oral, uh, orally, right? That's why, you know, if you, I don't know if you came across this, but oftentimes in order to pass on the history of a family or the history of a village or the history of a tribe, it was always done orally. So you would, at, at sunset, you know, the elders in the in the village or in the home will gather the young children to sit, you know, down and listen to them speak about what their ancestors did and their great grandfather did and all that, you know, all those things. And so the drumming was also an easy way to sort of communicate that same message. Wow. Yeah. Like story time or something. Yes, story time. <laughs> Hello, hello. They say hello, and then you know the, the elders would say hello, and then the children would respond hello. And so it's like tales, you know. And the English version is tales by the moonlight. You know, I remember there was a show back in the day. It was tales called Tales by the Moonlight. I exactly what that. I just said. Yes. <laughs> It's the sun is down, the moon is coming up, you know, it's a clear sky, the kids are sitting, you know, uh, in front of the elders and they're listening to tales, you know, listening to history and listening to fun stories that oftentimes communicate values of the people and the family, right? There's always a lesson to be gleaned from these things. It's not yeah. just, yeah, it's not just we do it casually. There's always... Uh, sort of an agenda to pass on some lesson, to pass on some value, to pass on some history, but it's done in such a fun way that I think the people that are listening don't oftentimes know that they're learning, but essentially they are. <laughs> yes, I remember yeah. we were just interviewing someone, um, Nana, mm -hmm. he was saying that in Ghana, he grew up watching a show, I forget the name now, but it was essentially a storytelling show, very um, educational, but fun yeah. and yeah, a lot of drums and singing. Right, and right. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Can you please tell me about how the process was with creating the book? This is your first time creating a book, correct? It is. I, I am a pharmacist by training. I, and so people are always a little confused. Why did you veer, why did you veer into uh, entrepreneurship and writing a Yoruba book? <laughs> you know, right. yeah. but I've already explained that. You know, it sparked it was sparked by my own passion and uh, my own strong desire to pass on this culture and not lose it. Right. Uh, and the question was how how was the process correct? Right, like I'm also curious about the physical process. Was it difficult to find someone to create the physical product, and how did you envision it in the beginning, and how did that change to now? So, as with a lot of things that I do, I always have an outline first in my head. Right, the the idea is sparked, and then I write down the outline of what I want. Yeah. Also, to add to our question. The tone, the the fact that it's also a tone book, I think that's and very, touch. yeah, very different and unique. So what, what was there a concept that you saw that inspired that or where, like, how did you come about with a tone book as well? So the tone book is so important. Number one, Yoruba language is a very tonal language. One a set of letters let me give you an example. I think you probably saw this in the interview. I, I don't know if they cut it off, uh, but I, you might have seen it in the interview that I did. OKO, three simple letters. But depending on the tone that you put, the accent mark that you put on each letter, it sounds different. And so tones are very important in your brow language because you don't want to make the mistake of singing a you know, being disrespectful because you're saying something, whereas you intended to say something else. So OKO can be OKO. You may not hear the nuances here, but they are, trust me. And I'll try to be a little louder so you can hear it. OKO, RE RE, because there are three tones in Yoruba. There's DO, which is the lower tone, RE, which is the middle neutral tone, and ME, which is the higher tone, right? So OKO, RE RE, middle tone, means farm. 
Oko. It's O-K-O, but it has a dot under the O's and some uh, a different set of accent marks on the O's is a uh, vehicle, like a car. And then you have Oko, which is Ho, which is like the car gardening tool. And then there are three other versions of the same. <laughs> yeah, so the tone is really key. And people oftentimes, you know, when I used to try to look for books, and I still do, you're about books, I would find that, you know, I'll get some books and the tones were, the accent marks were wrong, or they didn't even have any tones there. And they attempted to put my pronunciations, which don't really do it justice. So for me, I said, in order for people to really learn how to speak Yoruba, it, they have to hear it. It's not enough to read it because many people can't even read it with the tones. It, you know, I'm lucky that I retain that skill. I'm lucky that I can discern the sound when I hear the word. In fact, I have, you know, by, uh, uh, two versions um, of, of, of the Bible in Yoruba. And so... Even if I don't know the word, I can sound it out because I understand how to read the tones, right? So not to be too long when you hear, tones really do matter in Yoruba. You can't speak Yoruba without l hearing the, the words. And so, I mean, hearing it out, sound it out. And I recognize when I looked at the marketplace, I realized that they didn't really have that. And so for me, it was important for me to find something comprehensive that kids could use, something easy to use, user-friendly, that had song, that had the tones, that have the, you know, that has the accent marks on the letters because for, for the benefit of those that can read it, you know, that's important too. And then also had the translation in English because a lot of us speak English and so therefore it helps to drive the point home a little bit better. So for me, it was important to have something comprehensive. It's not enough to just have the words there. If you can't read the words, you have to at least hear it so you can sound it out. So, and just that, does that answer the question? I hope so. <laughs> yes, a little bit. And then just also going back to, was it difficult um, creating the actual project? Did you have someone that helped you uh, figure out like how the physical product would look and how you produced it? So I started the process um, with a really good support system in terms of, you know, my husband and my mom were around at the time that I had this idea. And so oftentimes I will bounce my ideas off of them. Right. But like I've mentioned earlier, I always had an outline in mind of how the content that I wanted in the book and everything there is original in the sense that it came from my head. Right. The technology, the technological aspect of it, definitely that had to be outsourced, right? Because you can't be a master of everything. I, <laughs> you know, I'm a pharmacist by training. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a software developer. So, you know, as with anything, you have to outsource some parts of the process. And so the technological aspect was outsourced. Now, finding the right people to produce the book was a little bit challenging because I think this is such a new concept that a lot of the people that I pitched the idea to didn't really understand what I was trying to do and maybe they understood but they didn't really appreciate the significance of what I was trying to do and so when I shopped it around to you know one or two or three publishers and they weren't moving quick enough for me and I didn't get a sense that I they understood exactly what I was trying to accomplish here. And the in the time frame with in which I was trying to accomplish it, I said, you know what, that's okay. I can do this on my own. <laughs> wow. You know, I can, I can, yeah, I can find, I'll find somebody to do it for me. I don't necessarily have to go through a middle man or middle company that is just stringing me along, you yeah. know. Um, and so that, you know, there, it, there were a couple of false starts in the sense that I would call, I called a publisher. And I think that initially the, the person I spoke with said, oh, we can definitely do this for you. And then the next time I followed up, they said, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't think so. It's not, you know, within our scope. And, you know, it could have deterred me. It could have um, uh, made me, it was disappointing but I think God had other plans for me in the sense that sometimes when you go through these processes, uh, you get to rely on, you get to have a little bit of faith 
and I'm incorporating some religious concepts here because I can't divorce myself from my spirituality, right? Um, and I know for sure that uh, the strength that I had and the doors that were open to get this accomplished only came through really God, right? I mean, of course, of course, I have my support system that were helping me, but I always give credit because I, I know for sure that I couldn't do it in my own strength, right? Given the magnitude of what I was trying to accomplish. And I, I'm not trying to say that, that I, I'm saying that with all humility, right? Um, right. So there were some challenges, but with, uh, uh, with my goal in mind, um, with some faith, uh, with determination and with my passion, you know, I was able to get it done. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, what are some of the reactions that you've received from either children or parents that have purchased or used the book? Honestly, this is um, this is probably the, one of the, you know the best part of this entire thing. I mean, aside from my family's reaction and my children playing with the book and getting so excited, oh, mommy, that's your voice, or you know, because again, oh, I I need, I need to go back. I I sang, I voiced the the words, every single word in English and Yoruba, I voiced it. Every single song in there, I sang it. So yeah. I yes. So I say that to say that this was so important to me that I didn't want to outsource these um, parts to other people because I want to communicate to which whoever child picks this book up that this is for you. It's okay to be you. And I think oftentimes uh, the your intent carries through into into what you do it, it in some way it carries through you know if you sing a song uh casually and you don't really care about what you're communicating it it will show so for me it was important for me to take on this task and really put myself into it so that the whole package uh communicates what i'm trying to communicate which is that it's okay to be who you are it's okay for you to embrace your language your culture you cannot separate yourself from who you are it is who you are you can be in a different environment but guess what you can be both you can be american and you can be african there's nothing wrong with that right and even in the imagery right because uh, you know uh, your is spoken in primarily in west africa but believe it or not is also spoken in um, places like brazil and cuba i'll be through their religious practices, because they are parts of uh, Cuba and Brazil where, unfortunately, our people, West Africans, were taken there. And I don't want to get into that aspect of things, but taken there. So Yoruba is one of the you major can, cultures. You can speak to that aspect very much, so, so feel free. <laughs> yeah, so, so the slave trade, unfortunately, people were forced to uh, they were disseminated or, you know, moved forcefully to become slaves elsewhere. And Yoruba is, the, is one of the only culture that actually survived that, that um, exile or that movement, if you will. Um, and that speaks to just how rich it is, right? That even in those uh, extenuating circumstances and in those harsh conditions that they still, some people were still able to hold on to a, their sense of identity because oftentimes what happens is, what happened back then, obviously, was that when they were taken as slaves, they were deprived of, they were given a new name. Mm. You know, they were stripped of their identity and given a new name and forced to learn a new language and forced to practice things differently than what they knew in their previous, you know, uh, their previous home. And so when I make that connection between then and now, for me, part of what drives me about this also is identity. Hmm. You cannot lose our identity. There were people who were trying to hold on to their identity and they couldn't because of the circumstances that they were forced into. And we have the autonomy, we have the ability to hold on to our identity. And for some reason, we're just casually letting it go. Why? And then we're doing our kids a disservice because part of who they are is their culture. It's, it's in their DNA. So Every, I'm trying to challenge every parent out there to say you're doing your children a disservice by not teaching them the little you know. And it doesn't. it's not an excuse that you only know a little because guess what? We all don't know a lot, but the little you have, you give them. I meet so many people that don't know how to speak Yoruba, you know, um, and they're so, they're, you know, they're so 
sad about it. You know, they often, you know, they often wish that someone had taken the time to teach them the language so that they could, you know, just feel um, like they're more connected, right? Or that if they go to, you know, Nigeria or then a Republic, because in Bene they speak Yoruba too, or Togo, that they can at least speak you know, the language to other people. And I don't mean to, you know, um, speak for those people that can't speak it, but I know from having interacted with a lot of people that are older now and can't speak the language, there is a sense of um, they're disconnected and then and then there's, yeah, it's a longing to, you know, but it's never too late, right? With, with, with books like this, you know, like that's a resource that has the tone, it's never too late. If there's a will, there's a way. Uh, now there are resources by God's grace. This is one of them that people can actually begin to use to learn the fundamentals. And hopefully, you know, hopefully we'll come, I'll come up with another level so that uh, the kids that have learned all the words, all the words in this particular edition can graduate to the next level. I think I've gone so far away from your initial questions. So you might have to remind me I <laughs> what that was. I think honestly, I think you answered it in the beginning. The other thing I wanted to say was that randomly, you know, I would just get a video from some person that I don't know on on um, Instagram, right? And and they'll say, "Look, my child is oh. is playing with the book," and they would, you know, record the child, and I can hear the squealing and the and the clapping and the giggles, <laughs> and I just get so happy because that's exactly what I was hoping for, was that you know the, these kids that are looking at this book will be so fascinated by it, and they're learning, but they're also having fun, right? Um, and so that that's that's been a wonderful thing. The second thing, actually, something that I alluded to earlier was my kids. When the when I first got the sample of the book, I remember my children were like, "Mommy, that's your voice. <laughs> Mommy, that's you." And you know, and then my 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 son, he says, "Mommy, you're you're my teacher. You're, you're I I want to be an author. I want to write a book." You know, so it's. It's a gift that keeps on giving in so many different ways. You know, I um, there was a lady that attended the Children's Hour with Yoruba Language that I recently hosted who is Caucasian, and she had adopted um, a Yoruba boy from Nigeria. And uh, I met her last year when I was a vendor at one of the community events, and she was so thrilled to have found this resource because she said that her son, her adopted son, was homesick. You know, and he was having a rough time adjusting to his new environment and all of that. And so being able to give him the book and have him hear the words that he probably heard, you know, in Nigeria before he was brought over here probably made him, you know, made him feel a little bit better. And 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 then also she didn't really know how to speak Yoruba. So getting this resource and, you know, them learning together is another way to bond. And then I'll say something else. There was another lady I met at another conference that I went to, it was a cultural conference, and she actually was very tearful. Hmm. She was tearful when she was talking to me because, and she was even at a loss for words. And, you know, she's she's a physician. She's a Nigerian physician in America. And I, th I'm, I can only imagine that she was tearful because she had been trying to figure out a way to get, to get her kids to learn the language, but probably, you know, with, you know, competing priorities and responsibilities, she, she wasn't able to really do it. And so when she saw the book and she, you know, I pressed it for her, she was just like, oh my goodness, you don't even know how much this means to me. So it's stories like that, that just make me feel fulfilled and make me feel that all of the resources that I pour, poured into this in terms of time, energy, uh, and and monetarily are, are all worth it. But I do only have one question left for you. Sure. Um, do you have any plans to create another book in the future, or was this a one-time thing? No, it's not a one-time thing. One-time thing, right? It's like I alluded to earlier. I said that hopefully I'll be able to come up with the next edition, which would allow kids that have you know, graduated from this, the, the I've, kids that have learned all the words and all the songs in this particular book to graduate to the next level and actually begin to, you know, formulate sentences and maybe practice. So my hope is that I will be able to get the resources to do that. Again, the previous project was funded um, independently 
independently, right? I didn't have any, I don't, they didn't have any institution um, giving me grants or anything. This was fund, fully funded by me. And so the, my goal is that somehow, some way, <laughs> I will get the resources to be able to bring other types of books because um, it's it's a series, right? And bring other editions out uh, for for kids to to learn and be, begin to build their vocabulary in Yoruba. Um, I will say this though: I don't limit myself to even just the language aspect. I think this is a way for me. It's a sort of like a vehicle for me to also approach my colleagues and my counterparts and my fellow parents to challenge them not to become so assimilated to this culture that they forget who they are. Because when they forget who they are, they can't teach the kids who they are. And in this society, as we know, there are many labels and many stereotypes. And so if you don't teach your kids and really uh, imbibe in them who they are, where they're from, what their identity is, trust me, somebody else will do it and it may not be to their benefit. And so for me, uh, this is, this is uh, it's sort of like a, a call, like a call-in. <laughs> yeah. It's like a call-in, yeah.